The word of God, if you're ready for the word, shout, yeah, yeah. Listen, I want you to turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 12, beginning at verse 4. We're going to read verses 4 through 6. It is our custom to stand for the reading of God's word. Amen. If you're a visitor, this is just our custom. We stand out of respect for God's word. Amen. It's the last time I'm going to ask you to stand until we get ready to leave, because obviously you can't leave if you're sitting. But for now, Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. I'm going to be reading out a good news Bible translation this morning, because I want to make sure that you're getting what I'm saying. Sometimes the these and the thous and the those that are in the King James Version make it very challenging to hear what I'm saying. So I'm just using this translation to make sure we can cut through all that and get to the point. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. The word of God reads, I'm going to read verse 4 through 6. The word of God reads this way. We have many parts in the one body. And all these parts have different Here's the word I want you to focus on, functions. Different functions. In the same way, though we are many, we are one body in union with Christ. And we are all joined together to each other as different parts of one body. So we are to use our different gifts in accordance with the grace of that God has given to us. I'm going to stop right there. Let's go back to verse 4. There's a part right there that really fascinated me that the Holy Spirit really made me pay attention to. It's the part where it says, all these parts have different functions. Different functions. And I'm going to use the subject this morning, finding favor in your function. That's my subject. Look at somebody say, neighbor... You're going to find your favor in your function. Father, bless this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Listen, everybody talks about having favor from God, the favor of God. I want the favor of God. I want his favor on my life, on my, on my children, on my family. But finding favor simply means gaining approval, acceptance. It means special benefits or blessings. So we talk about having God's favor on us. We're talking about getting his approval, getting his acceptance. So let me ask this question. Let me give you this question. What is a function? A function is a specific role or an intended purpose of a person or a thing. So we put these two things together. And what we're saying is that God puts favor on our function. That if you find your function, you will find your favor. That rather than you running around chasing it, looking for it, trying to find it, if you just get in position, if you just get in the place that God has ordained for you, there you will find your favor. The true value that a person brings to the world is when they are operating in what they were created to do. That's the true value that each of us bring, that each of us, God has created us with something that we bring to the world. And when you present your gift, your talent, when you show up in the world with that which God has created you to do, that is where your true value lies. Most people have not yet realized or been taught the unique value that they bring to the world. You don't know that you're uniquely made and that you're special and that there's nobody else like you in the world, that there's nobody else that can be like you, that you are unique as your fingerprint, that God, out of the millions and billions of people that have existed, there is nobody like you. You are uniquely crafted and put together by the almighty God. And your presence here in the room means that there is something special and something particular and something unique that God wants to put into the world through you. But many of us don't realize how unique and how valuable we are. We don't realize or we don't fully embrace our uniqueness. And so most of us end up being cheap copies of an original. Because you have not yet embraced how unique and special you are. 
One of the problems is this, is that we have these unspoken value systems that exist that tend to devalue the contribution that every person brings. For example, we have been taught that the CEO has more value than, say, the janitor or the dishwasher or the front desk clerk. And even in church, we, we've been taught that the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist has more value than, say, the children's worker or the usher or the praise team member or the kitchen volunteer. And these unspoken value systems sometimes make people feel discontented with the role that they play within the organization. Not understanding, listen, we all, somebody shout all. all. We all play an indispensable role. And listen, beloved, when you're not functioning in that capacity, the world is missing out. If you don't realize how indispensable you are, you'll pocket your gift and hide your gift like the proverbial man who puts his gift into the ground and hides it. And the bad thing about that is that we are suffering for the missing gift that lies within you. That the world, not just the church, not just this church, but the world is missing out on what you have because you are not functioning, Charlene, in your capacity. See, see, I, I got to talk about this. And I know we got to go. But see, we tend to place value on position and titles rather than on function. When the question was asked, Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom, that was position. Jesus responded, he that would be the greatest among you, let him be your servant. That was function. Let me run it back. When they asked who is the greatest in the kingdom, they was asking, what titles do we get? What position will we have? And Jesus said, he that would be the greatest among you, let him be your servant. They were talking about position. He was talking about function. He even the playing field. He placed everybody on the same level. So instead of placing value on position placement, he placed value on function. What role do you play? We place value on position where I sit, where God places value on function. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we're all focused on the title. I want the title. We're focused on where do we sit? Do I sit in the front row, the back row? Do I sit in the VIP section? We're all caught up into all those sort of things. When God is more concerned about your function, what do you do? That's why when we, that's why when we change people's positions and change their titles, they have a fit. I mean, they have cardiac arrest. Because you are tapped into your title and not into your function. And so if your title changes, you have an identity crisis because your identity is in your position. Your whole role and function in life depends on what they call you. And not so much what you do, what you contribute See, the truth be told, you can call me Reverend Facing, Brother Facing, Elder Facing, Pastor Facing. You can call me anything you want, but it doesn't change my function. Oh. See, 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 if my function was depending on a position, if you take my title, if you take my credentials, if you take my position from me, then I will lose my identity. But the truth be told, my true value is not on the title you put on me. It's what God has put in me. What do you do? I don't care about what your title is. I want to know what your function is. What do you do? Even in this church, I don't care about what we call you. Sometimes in nonprofits, you make up these highfalutin positions. You know, no, <laughs> nonprofits are good for that. They give you a highfalutin position, a great big name. You can't put the title on the business card, but that doesn't matter. What matters is what you do. What do you contribute to the organization? And let me say this. Let me say this. Though there are a variety of functions in every organization, there are a variety of functions in every organization, every church, and every family. But in God's eyes, function is ultimately just a different way 
of being a servant. Whether we call you the CEO, the worship leader, the pastor, the children's work, whatever, all these titles that we give people, they're all just different ways of saying, I'm a servant. So it doesn't matter what we call you, because the only thing that God is concerned about is that you are a servant. That's the only position God has in the kingdom, being a servant. And so you got to know your role and play it. Look at somebody say, I'm a servant. I'm a servant first. Yeah, I'm a servant first. Even in this church, I am the lead pastor. I am the lead servant. Y'all not talking to me. That every position that you have in this church or in your family is designed for you to serve in that capacity. Husbands, you are the head of your house, but your role is to serve your family. Not boss your family. Not belittle your family. Not dominate your family. You've been called to serve your family. If you're in a position of leadership and influence anywhere in this church or in the, in the world, God has called you to be a servant. And whatever title they put on you, vice president, CFO, praise leader, whatever, all it is is a fancy way of saying, I'm a servant. In fact, in fact, if you're going into business, it is a proven fact that the businesses that succeed the most are the people who are, designed, who are in business to serve people. That if you find a need and you serve, that will be the key to success for your business. That the people who are the most successful at it are not the ones saying, I'm going to get in it to see what I can get out of it. It's the ones who find a way to serve people through it. I ain't got time to mess with it. I'm leaving it alone. So, 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 it, so in our text, the apostle likens the church to a functioning body. And says that though we are many parts, we are one body. So rather than competing with one another, we should be completing one another. And the problem is there's such a strong spirit of competition in the church. Competition over pulpits, people, power, members, numbers, money that we do not see an opportunity to complete one another. That even in a church like this, that instead of us seeing an opportunity to complete each other, to help each other, to make each other better at what we do, we're busy competing with one another, therefore impeding our effectiveness in the world. Every member is essential to the body's well-being, and every part has its unique functioning. So functioning, that's what I want to focus your attention on. I want to talk about functioning. See, some people are focused on how many people are sitting. But God wants to folks talk, talk about people who are functioning. Everybody that's sitting ain't functioning. Everybody that's attending is not functioning. Everybody that's showing up today is not functioning. They shuttled into the building and they found a comfortable seat in a location somewhere in the building to get a good view, but just because you are viewing doesn't mean you're functioning. Oh, Lord. And just because you're a body in the room doesn't mean you're contributing to the program. Functioning as a member of the body of Christ means you are actively participating in and you are utilizing your gifts, your talents, and your resources for the benefit of the whole body. It ain't just about you. It ain't just about you. That the really functioning Christian does not walk into a church saying, what can the church do for me? But instead asks, what can I do for the church? Lord, I got to go. I want to ask you a, a question in here. Are you functioning or are you just existing? Are you functioning? Are you doing something? Are you contributing something to the whole? Are you presenting your gifts, your body, your talents, your abilities to the church? Are you contributing in some way or are you just on it for the ride? But today, I want to get you out of a position of sitting into a position of doing because the blessing is not on the people who sit. The blessing is on those who do. 
Oh, God, I ain't got time. The reason I'm trying to get you out of the seat of do-nothingness is because God doesn't invest in a bad investment. He's not investing in a stock that's going down. He's not investing his power and his authority and his anointing in people who just want to sit and quiver and quake under the power of the Holy Ghost. But the power that God, the blessing that God wants to release is on those who are doing something. Look at somebody say, do something. It ain't for the spectators. It ain't for the lookers. It ain't for the people in the pews. It ain't for the people that are looking around. It's for the people who are doing something. There is a special grace and a special power and a special favor and a special anointing that God has reserved for those who determine to do something. Would you hear somebody and say, do something? It's not for those who sit in the passenger seat and just enjoy the ride. I'm trying to get you motivated here. God said, I got something waiting on you. I got a favor. I got an approval. I got an anointing. I got help waiting on those who are going to do something. Why would I send help to you if you're not going to do nothing? Why would I send money to you if you're not going to do nothing? Why would I give you influence if you're not going to do nothing? Why would I give you opportunity if you're just going to stare at it? Look at somebody and say, do something. Ah, uh, My suspicion is that many people in the body of Christ are underutilized because they do not function. You're like a car that has no engine. It's pretty. It's sitting out there shining, but you don't go nowhere. You are underutilized. All that ability and all that time. And oh, look at all the time that God has given you. Blessed you with time. 20 years. 30 years. 40 years. As you look back over your life, what have you done? I feel like Janet Jackson this morning and asking, what have you done for him lately? I ain't talking about what you did back in 1982. I'm asking you, what are you doing now? I'm not talking about resting on your laurels and talking about your resume, what I used to do, how I used to serve. There are people in this church who brag about what they used to do, how they used to serve, how they used to work, and that's all fine. But I'm asking you, what are you doing now? You're not functioning. There are many people, I suspect, who were functioning, who were active, who were involved, but for whatever reason, they've gotten off and decided, I'm going to take a seat. And then wonder why the favor has stopped flowing. Because the flavor is not on your sitting, it's on your doing. Write this down. Your favor is in your function. Mm-hmm. Write this down, too. Favor always follows function. It's not the other way around. <laughs> you want favor, but no function. But favor follows function. If you find your function, you will find your favor. If you find your spot in the kingdom and then begin to operate in that capacity, Bible says this, that goodness and mercy shall follow you. You ain't got to chase favor. You ain't got to chase goodness and mercy. If you just get in line with God's rate, well, will for you, then the favor will find you. Ah. You don't have to cut. You don't have to bring down your standards. You ain't got to put down. Your, you, you ain't got to let down your standards and, and put yourself in positions that are compromising who you are. If you just do what God has called you to do and position yourself not to, not to just sit and look, but to do, favor will overtake you. Look at somebody and say, I need favor on my life. You are wired the way you are for a reason. And you have to discover and accept that reason in order to live a fulfilling life. So in a few minutes I have, I want to talk to you about purpose, I want to talk to you about passion, and I want to finally talk to you about placement. Y'all ready? Let's go. When I talk about purpose, I'm talking about doing the right thing. We talked last week about the power of letting go. Y'all remember that? And I talked about the danger of doing too many things. And how some people take on too many things and they experience burnout because you're taking on too many things. Good hearts, 
good intentions, but you're taking on too many things. You spread yourself too far, and you end up being weird and being mean. It's not that you're a bad person. It's that you've taken on too many obligations and responsibility, and you can't be everything to everybody. That some things you have to let go, that the only person who is an undying resource is God, but you are a limited resource. And when you spread yourself through too thin sometimes, you end up being a jack of all trades and a master at nothing. That we're never getting the full impact of your ability, of your talent, because you're, you're like somebody fighting with one hand behind your back. Wonder what you would accomplish if you had both hands on the job. Wonder what would happen if you pared down some of the things you've committed to and gave yourself to the few things as opposed to spreading yourself over many things. Jesus said this. He said, if you be faithful over a few things, I'll make you rule over much. That sometimes you're grabbing things and you're grabbing things and you're grabbing things and you're not getting the full impact of what you're able to do because you don't have the time and the energy and the ability to do all things well. It would be better to do a few things well than to do a hundred things and be mediocre at it. Yeah, yeah, Lord have mercy. Yeah, yeah, it is better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you take on too many things, you can experience burnout from doing too much, too long. Some of you been doing too much, too long. You was good for a minute. I got it, Pastor. I got it. But when you do too much, too long, it's like putting your foot on the accelerator in your car and never letting up. After a while, you're going to burn that engine out. You don't take no breaks. You take no vacations. You ask for no help. You get no assistance. You just say, Pastor, I got it. I got it. I, I got it. I, I, I got it. I, I got it. Next thing you know, you have abandoned your post. You have abandoned your position. You have abandoned your opportunity, not because you are derelict, but because you're just burnt out. Yeah, so, so it's danger on taking on too much. But what I also want to you say to you is you, you are equally in danger of doing, get this, the wrong thing. Some of you, your problem is not that you're doing too much. Your problem is you're simply doing the wrong thing. You got good intentions, because, but just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. Do you hear what I'm saying? Just because you can do it doesn't mean you ought to jump on it. Now, I understand that sometimes you have to take on responsibilities that's not in your wheelhouse. For example, if you work at a job and they have staffing shortages, you have to wear several hats to make up the difference of the shortage of staff. In a church like this where we have huge heart and huge ministry, but the, the, the problem is that the, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, so that means the few sometimes shall only have to wear a couple different hats. I understand that. We all do that sometimes. We got to kind of step in, fit in where we get in. But, I, but, but I'm trying to get you to grow to a place of maturity and understand what you do that is the best and highest use of your talents and gifts. And though you might fit in and substitute for a little while, don't make that the norm for you. The idea is to find what I uniquely bring and the flow in that. You with me this morning? So the question you should be asking yourself right now is, what am I supposed to be doing? If the favor of God is on my life and he, God wants to release it and he's waiting to dispense it to me and I'm not getting it, the question is, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Not discovering your purpose can lead to a wide range of problems, y'all, including lack of direction where you're just aimless. When you don't know what you're supposed to do with your life and your time, some people are just, frankly, quite aimless. You're not shooting at anything. You're like somebody shooting an arrow in the dark and hope you hit something and wonder why you're unhappy. You're not hitting anything in particular when it comes to your career, when it comes to your money, when it comes to your relationships, when it comes to what God was. You want to be in ministry. Can we pare it down and be more specific? What area of ministry? Instead of being broad and being general, and you wonder why you're not hitting the target like you're supposed to, because you are aimless, because you haven't figured out what you're supposed to be doing. 
You miss opportunities. Your gifts are underutilized. You have a constant feeling of discontentment that you can't explain. I know I'm supposed to be doing something. I'm always dissatisfied. I'm always discontented. I'm always trying to figure out what's wrong with me. You know what the problem is? You haven't figured out what it is you're supposed to be doing. Therefore, you are ineffectively using your time and your resources. You're throwing money at stuff. You're giving time to stuff, energy, your body, to stuff that doesn't have any return. Because you are aimless. You're not going after your purpose. You're just doing something to be doing it. You don't live by a calendar. You don't live by a strategy. You don't live by uh, a, a desire to fulfill purpose or destiny. You just wake up in the morning and stretch and yawn and say, what am I going to do today? Nothing. I'm going to go to church today. What am I going to do at church today? Nothing. I'm going to watch and see if the praise team sing my favorite song. I'm going to see if the pastor's message is hitting today. But aside from that, I get to be a critic. Angela, I get to be like Cisco and Ebert. I get to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down to the service. Yeah, I give y'all a C for worship today, and I give the pastor a C plus because I like what he said last week. You, 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 you're giving scores and credits to the worship, but you don't contribute to the worship. You don't realize as we come together and form a body of worshipers that that's where the presence of God comes in. You came to see what was going to happen instead of making something happen. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You came to see if God was going to show up rather than bring the presence of God in with you. You came to see if somebody would do something to make you leap as opposed to creating an atmosphere that we all got to leap. Oh, my God, I got to go. Your relationships are strained because you are out of place. No wonder you and honey can't get along. It's not him. There's nothing wrong with him. It's you. That discontentment you have, so now you're ready to go to divorce court, talking about he ain't satisfying me. No, the issue is you are not satisfied with yourself. And you want somebody to give you something that you haven't first given yourself. You're going to make it somebody else's job to make you happy, to stimulate you, to get you excited because you have nothing that you bring yourself. And that's too heavy of a task to put on anybody to make them be your constant clown and make you happy all the time. The question is, what are you doing for yourself? Oh, my God. For the people who come to the church with their buckets out saying, fill me up, but never want to pour anything into anybody else. And so your personal relationships are strained and your business relationships are strained because you don't see the power of partnership. Partnership simply means I bring something and you bring something. But it's bad when you try to be a partner and you get all the getting and I get nothing. There ain't no partnership. There ain't no, par ain't no partnership if you're the one getting all the goody and I'm not getting anything out of it. I got to break this relationship up. <laughs> <laughs> so not discovering what you bring to the table and then bring it to the table, put strain on your relationships. And get this, most people don't talk about this, but not discovering your gifts and talents makes you an increased candidate for the risk of mental health issues. <laughs> that many of you are having an emotional and a mental breakdown simply because you have not discovered what God has created you to do. You're about to lose your mind, drive you crazy, and drive all of us crazy with you simply because you have not figured out what you're supposed to be doing. You're here and you're there. You're up and you're down. You're schizophrenic. You date everybody. You commit to nobody. You don't commit to anything or anybody on any level, this church, that church, or any place else, and you are on the risk of having great bouts of depression, increased risk of mental health. Because you are not being utilized in the way that the master has called for. In fact, you are being used by everybody and everything but God. 
And you're never going to be happy until you find yourself in the hands of the creator. You've had yourself in the hands of your lover, in the hands of the drug dealer, in the hands of your friends, in the hands of your family. But you don't have yourself in the hands of God. And until you get yourself in God's hand and begin to operate in what he has called you to do, you're going to be on the verge of being crazy all the time. Nothing wrong but that you're out of place. You weren't designed to be used by nobody's pimp. See, I got to go there. See, when I try to be theological, Jill, they just pay me no mind. You weren't designed to be nobody's doormat. You weren't designed to be nobody's drug dealer. You were called and designed to be used by God to be a tool in the master's hand. The enemy wants to use your gifts for anything but what you were created to do. And so you were born with the gift of gab, but you don't use your mouth to help people or win souls. You use your mouth to tear people down, to rip up families, to rip up communities. You are a gifted writer. You are a gifted teacher. You are a gifted musician, but you only use your gifts to work for the enemy instead of the God who called you. Look at somebody and say, I belong to God. Number two, let's talk about passion. When I talk about purpose, I'm talking about doing the right thing. Look at somebody and say, do the right thing. You got ten different options of things you could do, but you have to do the right thing if you're going to have God's favor. Just because you can do it don't mean God's favor is on you. The devil blesses people too. Oh. Let's talk about passion, though. Number two, when I'm talking about passion, I'm talking about having the right attitude. That when you show up in the world, when you show up at church, when you show up in your job, you bring energy to it. That the whole place feels you when you show up. That there are certain people that when they show up in the room, there is a shift in the atmosphere. Oh, my God, to be the kind of person that without saying anything, without making an announcement, without somebody trumpeting my name, when I walk in the room, the whole atmosphere shifts because I bring energy. Oh, my God, I bring energy to it. I don't show up in anything that I cannot influence. If I show up in the room, something in the room has to change. If I show up on a job where devils and demons and witches and warlocks are running amok, when I show up, something in the room begins to shift because an anointed man has walked into the room. When I bought my house in my community, the whole neighborhood shifted. Y'all, y'all don't believe this. The whole neighborhood should shift because there's a praying family living there. There's something about this church. If you become a member, if you become a visitor, that there's something about your presence here that should shift the atmosphere. You should wonder about yourself if, if you leave and nobody misses you. You should be concerned. So and so left and we didn't even notice because you have not brought enough to the table that we would even care. <laughs> Some of you say, I'm going to leave him. They'd be glad you left because you ain't bring nothing anyway. <laughs> All you brought was drama, confusion, craziness, disruption, but you never brought real energy to it. In fact, you are a Debbie Downer. When you walk in the room, we all get depressed. Oh, Lord. I was fine till she showed up. I was fine till he showed up. But there's something about you that when you show up with your passion for your job and you're functioning in your gift and you're flowing in your function, that when you show up, everything around here knows that I'm here. Some of y'all like that in the world. You know what I'm talking, right? That the party might have been dead till you showed up. <laughs> See, Jill, I hate the, I hate, I hate having to do that. You, I mean, the whole party was dead, Daphne, dead. They eating potato chips, standing around on the wall, looking at each other. Ain't nothing happening. But when you showed up, when you showed up, Charlie, hey, party over here. Huh? You were waving your hand in the air like you just don't care. 
that we wasn't even partying until you showed up. Y'all got that when it come to the world, but then y'all get in church and try to be a wallflower. The devil is a liar. When I came, I came with my praise. When I came, I came with my dance. When I came, I came to lift my hands. When I came, I came to stomp my feet. And y'all can be dead if you want to. But my God is so good to me. When I showed up, I'm going to give him a praise if I got to praise him by myself. If the organ don't play and the drummer don't drum, Daphne, I got to dance in my feet all by my, where are my praises at in here? Where are my disruptors in here? Where are my party starters in here? Make some noise for Jesus. I came to start it. I came to get it started. Mike, Mike, Michael, I came to get it started. It didn't even matter who was here. If it was just me by myself, I came, oh, Lord. If you didn't come to party, is what they used to say, sis. If you didn't come to party, then why are you even here? I came. Y'all act like y'all so saved. I hate y'all. I do. Y'all act like y'all so saved. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Listen, I look, slap somebody and say, I came to get it started. I came. I don't know what you came to do. Let me put it in church terms because they're getting all tight. I don't know what you come to do. I come to lift my hands. I come to stomp my feet. I came to lift them up. I came to leap for joy. If that's what you come to do, jump on your feet and do. I said, somebody do what you came to do. You ain't even got to ask permission. You ain't got to look for nobody to give you no high sign. Everybody came to give God a praise. Open your mouth and take over this place right now. Ah! Okay, wait. Sit down. I'm not supposed to get happy yet. I bring energy to this. Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of God. That's what feeds me. What feeds me is doing the will of God. It feeds me like nothing else. Not watching, not spectating, not talking about it, not fixing to do it. That's how they talk in Texas. You're fixing to do it. It's doing it. It's something about doing it that feeds me. What do you enjoy doing? If you're doing something that you don't enjoy, you won't do it well, and you won't do it long. Because I hate it. I hate to do it. It gets on my nerves. I don't get nothing from it. And so I use every opportunity to avoid it, because I just frankly don't like it. It don't feed me. It doesn't do anything for me. Let me use this for example. For example, uh, public speaking is one of the greatest fears that people have, right up there with death. That the fear of standing up in front of people and presenting, either on a stage, a pulpit, or even in a corporate presentation, giving a presentation to some people. Public speaking is one of the greatest fears. There are people who'd rather die <laughs> than get up and talk. Now, 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 there are some people who naturally gravitate to an opportunity to speak. They love an opportunity to speak. They relish an opportunity to speak. They want to do it. I'm just waiting for somebody to call me, anybody. They got the gift of gab. They talk, ain't nobody talking to them. Talk to yourself. It's, I got to be talking. <laughs> they talk about what they know. They talk about what they don't know. They talk on the bus. They talk to strangers. Because you, you have a natural gift for that. You have a natural Pull. And you might have to train it and develop it, but you have a natural gravitation. You, you're attracted to it for some reason. But for some people, the idea of taking a microphone, they'd rather be dead. If I asked them to get up and do an announcement, they would go into, oh, my God, a fit. Oh, a fit. Sick for three days. Can't get up. Can't go to work. Why? Because we asked you to do the announcements on Sunday, and I just don't like it, Pat. There are some people who, listen, if you ask them, now, now, if you put them somewhere else, they'll flow. 
If you put them somewhere in administration or in media or in music or somewhere else that they don't have to be up talking, they will flow, they will shine, they will flow, they will grow. But if you put them in something that's not what they're wired to do, they hate it. So what happens is, and I've done this mistakenly, sometimes I put people up to talk not realizing that they really have a real distaste for it. And so they'll do it, but they're always trying to find excuses for not doing it. Let somebody else do it. I'm sick. I can't make it. I had something to do. I had to work. See what I'm saying? Because they're trying to avoid it because that's not how they're wired. If you find your function, Lee, you'll find the grace to do what you need to do. What am I saying? When you get in your vein, you make it look easy. I can wake up and do it because I do this easy. It's not that you don't work. It's not that you don't train and develop. But you don't go through the same hurdles as somebody who is not gifted for that. Because you got a grace for it. You got so much grace for it that even when you're tired, you still do it. Because it gives me something. Oh, God, I got such a grace for this that when other people quit and walk away, I'm still chugging along because God has graced me. You know what I mean by grace? God has given you divine ability to flow in that function, to do what you do. And so when other folks give out, give up, don't want to come to rehearsal, don't want to give up, don't want to show up, don't want to be there making excuses, you're like, here I am, Lord. Send me. I'm tired, but I'm here. I'm I'm weak, but I'm here. I had a struggle, but I'm here. I had a hard time, but I'm here. I had some mistakes this week, but I'm here. I'm mad at people, and people are mad at me, but I'm here. I'm not hanging out in the lobby when it's preaching time. I'm here. I'm here to serve, to give, to be there, because God has given me a grace for this. Got a passion for it. It is a sad thing to watch somebody doing something they have no passion for. I'm here now, but I wouldn't want to go to a barber if they ain't got no passion for it. Here, sit in the chair. Let me. Don't cook me a dinner if you ain't got no passion for it. Here, take this hungry man meal and shut up. Don't get on this stage and sing a song if you're going to look like you ain't got no passion for it. Sit down, find something else to do. Just because you can sing don't mean you should be singing because people who really want to do it, child, I like doing this. I get something out of doing this. I'm happily serving the Lord. I'm happily playing instruments. I'm happy worshiping. If you got a bad attitude, sit down. Please sit down. Having you up there ain't helping us. Watching you go through gyrations and you being mad and we got to call you up and we got to remind you and we got to call you. Why do I have to remind you to do something you got a passion for? When you got a passion for something, you'll show up early to work. You'll leave late from work. You'll do time when you don't need to be there because I got passion for it. I like doing it. Is there anybody in here who is passionate about serving your God? Give him praise right here, right here. Oh my God, I got to go to another service. Slap about three people around you and say, I got passion for this. I got passion for this. It gets on your nerve, on your nerve, but I like doing it. You only have grace to do what you've been called to do. You know why you can't do that task long? You know why you can't do that task well? Because you're not called to do it. And because you're not called to do it, you don't have the grace for it. And because you don't have the grace for it, it gets on your nerves. When they ask you to do it, you don't do it. You don't show up. You don't want to be bothered with it. And it's not that you're a bad person. It's just that you don't have the grace for this. You see these singers up here? They don't just show up on Sunday morning. They're doing rehearsals midweek. They're rehearsing songs on the phone. They, they, they get a list of songs they have to rehearse. They're rehearsing in the shower and everything. They're not just performing on Sunday morning. They're performing on week. What you get on Sunday morning is what they've been doing all week long. You couldn't give that kind of service if you don't have passion for it. 
Well, what's, what's the song we going to sing? And what key is it? And I don't know that song. And that's a hard song. Let's do an easy song. Shut up. Sit down. And find what you're supposed to be doing. And when you find what you're supposed to be doing, your smile will come on your face because I'm doing what I like to do. I might be in the kitchen cooking, but I enjoy doing it. I might be in the media room, but I enjoy doing it. I might be working in the sound, but I enjoy doing it. I might be over there talking to the kids, but I enjoy doing it. But God help you. God help you if you're stuck in something that you have no passion for. And sticking you in something that you have no passion for means you have no grace for it. And having no grace for it means we're not blessed by it. Did you hear what I said? We're not blessed by it. You have no creative instinct. You have no creative ideas. Nothing comes to you because that's not what God has graced you to do. It's nothing against you. It's just that you're supposed to be over here and you're stuck over here. So one of the clues as to whether or not you are flowing in the right thing is do you have passion for it? That's a simple question. Are you excited about it? Do you want to do it? Do you look forward to doing it? And if you don't, you got to find your function. Last thing is this. I'm almost out of here. I want to talk about placement. I want to talk about placement. It's not just enough to be doing the right thing or having the right attitude. It's also about being in the right place. So I want to talk to you about placement. A lot of people, I believe, are simply, Charlene, misplaced. And so here you are putting money, and passion, and energy, and time into things that you were never intended to do in the first place. So you're putting energy into people that you were never supposed to be connected to. And there you are hanging on with white knuckles to something that God is saying, let go of. But they've been my friend for 20 years. That some of you have some ungodly connections that need to be severed, that need to be broken. Some of you have relationships, business relationships that need to be broken. But your insistence on being connected to them is taking away from something that you're supposed to be doing. So all the energy you put into this person, you don't have the real energy to put into the right person, and you'll never get to the right person as long as you're hanging out with the wrong person. That's for all my single people. You'll never get to who you're supposed to be with as long as you're hanging out with who you're not supposed to be with. So all that love and all that passion and giving your body and all that to the wrong person. Meanwhile, Mr. Right is missing out on, oh God, I got to go to the next service. Meanwhile, Mr. Right is missing out on you because you're tied up with the wrong person. <laughs> some, of you, some of you are misplaced. You're in the wrong places. You're not in the right rooms. You're in the room, but you're not in the right room. You're bragging because you got, I'm in the room. But ain't nothing in this room designed for you. Oh, I'm in the room with them. I'm in the room, but nothing in this room has anything to do with your destiny. And you can't get things to flow, and you can't get things to work, and all you get is bragging rights, but you got no power. Because you're in the wrong room. If you left that room and just went into the right room, everything you've been believing God for would suddenly flow into your life. Is anybody hearing me in here? Some of you, it's just as simple as leaving that room and getting into the right room. You got to get around some thinkers. You got to get around some innovators. You can't keep running around with people who are negative, who don't want nothing, who don't want to go nowhere. And you can't keep trying to drag people where they don't want to go. If you hear a voice like Abraham saying, leave your country, then you leave. Don't take lot two. Everybody ain't going to be able to go.
So rather than so rather than get in the room that God is trying to put you in, you rather stay in a room that sometimes is too small for you. You can tell you're in the wrong room because the conversation bores you. The whole conversation is stupid. And there you are trying to be amused and laugh at these corny jokes. You're in rooms where they want to talk about people and run down people. You're not in a room where people talk about destiny and purpose and what you could do and where you could go. And so you are choking on your environment. Oh God, who am I talking to in here? Some of you right now, you are choking on your environment. Nothing wrong with you. It's the company that you're keeping. Something in you is saying right now, I'm better than this. I mean, this is who I used to be cool with, and I'm not trying to be funny, but something in me turned. Something in me switched. Something in me changed and said, it's time for me to get out the game. And I know I've been doing this for years. In fact, my nickname is Slick Willie, but I'm not trying to be slick no more. I'm trying to be a businessman. I'm trying to be somebody taken seriously. I'm tired of being known as Slick... <laughs> I see if I get started, I start just saying stuff. <laughs> if they still call you by your nickname, that should bother you. Some of you had nicknames that were really uh, <laughs> questionable nicknames, but they fit where you were at the time. If you're now 50 years old and they still calling you that, that means you have not changed at all. Something about me should say, it's time for me to get out of this room. The conversation is too small. We're not talking about nothing. We're on the phone talking about gossip and who did what and who wore what. Some of you today, when you leave church, you're not going to talk about the word and what it taught you and what you got out of it. You're going to talk about what so-and-so wore and what so-and-so said and who had their hair done and who had on nice shoes. Ah, get out of here. I need to be around some people who are talking about some real stuff. I need to be somebody who are talking about where I'm going yeah, and not where I've been. Tell somebody, say, get out of that room. Get out of that room. I don't, who am I talking to in here? Get out of that room. It's too small. It's too elementary. It's too infantile. You're never going to get anywhere going around that same conversation. Get out of that room. You weren't supposed to be there in the first place. Oh, oh, oh. Listen, the Bible says this. The Bible says that God has placed us in the body as he saw fit. God has placed us. He's placed us, Lee. You didn't just stumble into it. You didn't, you didn't stumble. You didn't, you didn't fall into it. You didn't accidentally bump into your place in the body of Christ. That the Holy Spirit wired you in a certain way, crafted you a certain way, gifted you a certain way, so that you would fit in the body in a certain place. It is so unique and so individualistic that can't nobody take your spot. It is tailor-made for you. You could do the same thing I do in it, but you don't do it like I do it because this was tailor-made for me. That's for all you worry about somebody trying to take your seat. You can't upseat me because this has been uniquely crafted. It's like a tailor-made suit. It dips where I dips. It hangs where I'm supposed to hang. It has all the things that make it me. You can put the suit on, but it's going to look different on you. Because it was created for me. <laughs> Who am I talking in here? And so God says, this is why I have to trust God. The Bible said that God placed us according to his will. Not man placed us. And the problem is, see, we don't have enough wisdom to know. We just stick people somewhere. I need a tenor. Here, you sit right there. I need somebody to play. You sit right here. I need somebody on media. You sit right there. And so we don't have the insight 
into a person's wiring and their gifting and their abilities. And so sometimes we are guilty of misplacing people. And then some people get stuck in something that somebody put you in, but it wasn't where God put you. And now you're going crazy because you are in something that a man put you in as opposed to what God put you in. But God said, I have placed you. There's a spot for you. Oh, God, get me out of here. There's a spot for you that if you find that spot, can't no devil stop you? Can't no demon stop you? Can't no hater stop you? Can't no mistake stop you? Can't no issue stop you? Because I'm in my spot. God, oh, God, I got to get off it. God, God, who has foreknowledge and predestined you that he had a particular spot and a particular role and a particular function that he wanted you to play and now he's trying to get you into the role that he wants you to play and every time you are not in your position we are missing something over here because you are over there you are wired the way you are for a reason If God wanted you to function a certain way, he would have gave you that gift. If he wanted you to be a foot, he wouldn't have made you an ear. But you, you see, see, you trying to be a foot when God has called you to be an ear. And so you are a fake carbon copy ear. You are an ineffective ear because you don't see me walking on my ears. My feet were made for walking. My feet ain't made for hearing. And I know it's a crazy analogy, but that's how some of you look in the spirit. You're supposed to be operating over here, but you're all busy trying to be over here because somebody placed you over there. But I'm going to free somebody today. I want you to be free to be you. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. How long are you going to be functioning in something that somebody you to do as opposed to what God has called you to do. I'm breaking somebody free today. Look at somebody say, I'm going to be free to be me. I'm free to be me. I'm free to be me with my crazy self, with my wild stuff, with my outrageous self, with my unspoken self. I'm free. There's nothing more free than having the space to be yourself. I ain't got to be you. I ain't got to dress like you or talk like you or walk like you. God likes me the way I am. Some of y'all, we ain't seen the real you yet because you still bound up with somebody said you ought to be. Wonder who you would be if you came out the box and decide to be yourself. This is the way I praise God. This is the way I jump. This is the way I dance. This is the way I talk. Leave me alone. Would you find about three people and tell them I'm free to be me? Oh my God. If you don't get nothing else today, I'm going to set you free to be yourself. Daphne, you got to be yourself. When you be yourself, the power flows. The anointing flows. The grace flows. Wait a minute. This is why I have to be in a church like this. Because I can't be in a church where I got to sit down and fold my hands and be quiet. Because that ain't me. I got to get around some folks that just as wild and crazy and free and loose as I am. If that's you, would you give God 30 seconds of your best praise right here? I'm me. I'm being me. I'm not for everybody, but I am for somebody. I'm free to be me. I'm finally free to be me. I'm finally, would you shake somebody by hand and tell them, neighbor, I don't mean to get on your nerves. But I'm finally free to be me. So excuse me for a minute while I give God a praise. Now go ahead and praise him for yourself. Clap those hands. I'm breaking out of church 
churches where they don't let me be me. I'm breaking out of relationships where I can't be me. I'm breaking out of friendship. I'm breaking up with somebody because they won't let me be me. Please leave me alone and let me be me. Yeah. Look at somebody say, get in your lane. Get in your lane. Get in your lane. You in the lane all by yourself. Can't nobody beat you at being you. You gotta get in your lane. Get in your flow. Get in your bag. Get in your calling. Get in your function. Get in your gifting. And if you do, God! I feel favor falling on somebody. I feel, somebody do this for me. Wait a minute. Somebody do this for me. Take a step to the left. Just to the left. Take another step to the left. Take another step to the left. Pastor, why are you doing this? Because God said to tell you for every step you're taking, you're leaving out of something you're not supposed to be in, and you're stepping into something you're supposed to be in. And when you step in, when you step in, yeah! I'm preaching with passion. I'm dancing with passion. I'm playing with passion. I'm serving. If you just get in your place, if you just get in your place, if you just get in your position, if you just get in what God has called you to be, if you turn loose and turn loud, if you let go and let God, if you come out of it, a drug dealer but I ain't no more I was a liar but I ain't no more I was an alcoholic but I ain't no more I done stepped into my destiny Angela all the time I wasted I was made to praise it come on you got something down to you that needs to get out come on I'm happy because I'm coming out of something and I'm coming into something. I'm coming into my calling. I'm coming into my purpose. I'm coming into why God created me. I never. Clap your hand and give God a praise. Come on, lift those hands and give God a praise. Let everything that has breath give God a praise. I was made to praise him. I was made to give him glory. I was meant to celebrate him. If I don't get a title and I don't get a position and nobody recognizes me, one thing I know for sure, I was created to praise him and I'm going to do it. Clap your hand and give God praise all the building. If you feel God pulling you out of something and putting you into something, I hear God saying, I'm shaking somebody loose out of something right now so I can put you in something else. When I put you in the right thing, everything you've been praying for is about to be released into your hands. Would you give God praise for releasing favor into your hands? I said praise him for releasing favor into your hands. Oh my God. 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 It's not going to have to work that hard for it. You're not going to have to cry for it.
Some of you are working too hard for something that God is dying to give you. Ain't no shame in moving into what God has called you to do. True story. True story. When I worked at the Potter's House of Dallas, I was the director of ministerial affairs. And my job was to recruit, identify, train, and release ministers in our church. At the time, we had over 400 ministers that I oversaw. And my job was to help them find their place. And so one afternoon, one minister came to me with tears in his eyes. And he said, Pastor, you know what? He said, you know, we do funerals and weddings and communion and preaching and teaching and all that. Alfonso, he said, but Pastor, that's not what feeds me. He, he, he's a minister, too. He went through all the ministerial training. Now, you have to understand, to be a minister at that church, there's years of training. You don't just walk in and say, I'm a minister. No, there's years of training, years of classes, years of instruction before they give you a piece of paper that calls you minister so-and-so and elder so-and-so. So, in other words, there was an investment. And after years of investment in this young man becoming a minister, after about six months, he realized, I'm not called to be that kind of preacher. I'm not called to do that. I don't want to be up here talking. I don't want to do hospital visits. I don't want to be praying for people. I don't want to do that. That's not, that, that's not what I like to do. He said, Pastor, but what I do feel the anointing in my life is when I do media production. When I'm creating skits and videos and things like that, commercials, that's when I feel God's anointing on me. When I'm up doing communion or teaching or singing, he said, I don't like that. I just did it because they asked me to. And my, my father was a minister. My uncle was a minister. So I felt like I had to be a minister. And everybody said, I'm articulate and I'm smart and I should be a minister. But we got to be honest with you, Pastor. I don't feel it. I don't feel When I'm doing that, I don't feel the anointing on me. I don't feel God's presence on me. But when I'm doing this with video, videography, and production, I feel God's hand on me. It comes on me as strong as it comes on you when you are preaching. And I say, you know what, minister? I'll receive your credentials. I received them. I received his collar. I released him to go into his passion, to operate in his function. And long story short, that young man left from there and started a video production company that's making hundreds of thousands of dollars doing videos for people all over the country. When he had to stand up there and do uh, 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 communion, stuff like that, his face was just so down and depressed. But when you see him now operating his video production, he got a great big smile on his face like, yeah, I'm doing my thing. His marriage is better. His kids are happier. His pockets are fatter. Because <laughs> I found my function. Some of you are going to have to have enough nerve to step out of preconceived ideas as to what you're supposed to do and step into what God has called you to do. And if you find your function, money won't be a problem. Favor won't be a problem. Doors will open for you. It won't be as hard as you think because I'm flowing in my function. What am I saying? When you're functioning in alignment with God's purpose and you're using your gifts effectively, you will see evidence of God's favor in your life. In your performance, I'm not talking about putting on a show, but you'll be effective. If you're not effective, you start asking yourself questions. Pay attention to the impact that you have on people around you. What am I saying? When you do what you do, 
Are people edified by it? Are they strengthened by it? Are they encouraged by it? Are they blessed by it? I came this afternoon to say one thing to you in this room. Get in position. Get in position. For some of you, you're about to see God start doing musical chairs around here. He told me about the spirit. You're going to start seeing me moving people around. Not me, not Pastor Faison. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. Because he said, you're not effective there. And don't take it personal. If you're a ministry leader, don't take it personal when they leave your area to go serve somewhere else. They're just finding the place they're more effective. Oh, God. I, it's, a, it's important to me. I've got to a place in my life, Regina, where at this stage in my life, I don't really care what you think. What I really care about is what he thinks. The closer I get, the older I get, the more I realize how important it is to hear God say, well done. You ain't going to get no well done from God if you're just doing something. You got to be doing the thing that he's called you to do. Stand to your feet. I'm done. Stand to your feet. Everybody. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. When I started preaching this message, what the Lord impressed upon me once again is that face, and this is not your church. It's my church. It's my church. And because it's his church, he gets to do whatever he wants to do. He gets to use who he wants. He gets to refuse who he wants. He gets to raise up who he wants. He gets to put down who he wants. The Holy Spirit right now is stirring up somebody's gifts and somebody's talents and somebody's abilities. You've been sitting on your talent, your gift. You're making excuses for it. You've been denying who you really are, trying to be what somebody wants you to be. But I want you to lift your hands right here and surrender to the Lord and say, Lord, have your way. 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 Give me focus. Give me direction. Show me what I'm supposed to be doing. Show me how I'm supposed to be operating. Show me where I'm supposed to fit. Give me the grace to let go of some things that I'm hanging on to. Give me the boldness to step out of what they've been calling me and to step into what you're calling me to be. These young people in here, they need to learn now that God has a purpose for their life and that his hand is on them. The earlier they figure it out, the less mistakes they'll have to make. The sooner they figure it out, the less time and money and resources that they'll waste because I'm flowing in the gift of God. God, for every person on the sound of my voice, I'm praying that you, Lord, begin to deal with them. For somebody in here, Lord, they've been running, running from you. You've been talking to them in their dreams and their plans. And they know they need to serve. They're not serving you like they're supposed to. They know it. Some of them are in church right now. Some of them got positions, but they know church, but they don't know you. I'm trying to get out of here. Father, I pray for them right now that something in them would shake loose. That something would break loose. That they would seize this opportunity. That they would forget the people that are around them and say, I'm going to answer the call on my life. If, if you're in here today and you're not saved, I want to open the doors to the church to you and give you this opportunity to give your life to Jesus. I need everybody praying. I need everybody praying. I need everybody praying. Somebody in here needs Jesus and you've been out of place for a long time. Your life's not going to go right until you put your life in the hands of the master. If you're in here and you're not saved, I want to invite you to this altar to give your life to Jesus. I, I, got, I got ministers in position. In fact, I want you to check your row. Check your row. Do a row check. Don't just assume that the person standing next to you knows Jesus. Would you invite that person to the altar? Tell them you'll go with them. You'll walk with them. 
It's scary. It's about 10 feet for some of you from your seat to the altar, but it feels like a mile. But if it's you, I'm coming. I'm coming to Jesus. I'm a backslider. I've, and I've been out of place for years. But I'm getting in position right now. For somebody, you're not a backslider, you're not an unbeliever, but, but you know you're not sensing. Hold on, turn me down some. You're not sensing God's hand on you like you're supposed to. You're, you're not sensing a free flow of the ministry that God has put in you. And you know God has plans for you. If that's you, I need you to rush to this altar. We're suffering for the lack of your gift. You hear what I'm saying? The body, the body is suffering. While you're trying to be a prophetic eye, meanwhile, I don't have evangelistic feet. You're out of place. You're out of place. You're out of place. Maybe you're not supposed to be on the praise team. I appreciate you. I do. Thank you for lending your voice. But maybe that's not where you're supposed to be. Maybe God has something else. That was something temporary. But now I want you stepping into purpose. And if that's you, wherever your position is, whatever your title is, if you don't care about your title and you don't care about your position, will you come and let these ministers pray for you? Because there's favor on your function. Receive my worship. Receive my worship. Alfonso, bring that young man up here. Bring that young man up here.